Good morning, everyone, and welcome back after what I hope was a great spring break. This lecture that I'm going to deliver this morning uh, has been an inspiration to students who have selected option three for their paper topic, how to design a Roman city, because this lecture has it all. It has great architecture. It has an extraordinary patron, uh, a man who uh, traveled the empire to all kinds of exotic places, that we'll, some of which we'll be talking about today and some of which we'll be talking about in the future, a love triangle, uh, some of the best buildings that we'll see in the course of, sem of the semester, including the Pantheon and also Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli. The patron, Hadrian, whom I show you in a portrait from Rome, now on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, at, it was an extraordinary man. Uh, he, became, he was born in uh, 76 AD, and he became emperor at the age of 41 after having served with Trajan for a number of years. He was born, like Trajan before him, in Spain, not in Italy. And uh, he also was the most educated, one of the most educated and most intellectual of the Roman emperors. We'll talk about the impact that that intellect had on his architecture. I mentioned that he already, he also <coughs> liked to travel. He traveled extensively during his reign, had three major, uh, major trips that had an enormous impact on his architecture and also on architecture around the empire. And it's also important, I think, to know that he reversed Trajan's policy. You'll remember that Trajan's major uh, political policy had to do with uh, military conquest, that Trajan was involved in a number of very important wars, uh, and he celebrated those wars, and he, he extended the empire to its furthest reaches, reaches that were never gone beyond uh, for the rest of the Roman Empire. Hadrian uh, reversed that policy. He was a peace-loving man. He had no interest in being involved in these kinds of military exploits, although he had served with Trajan in some of them in earlier years. He had no desire to continue that on. Uh, and he was much more concerned with uh, consolidating and preserving the empire as expanded by Trajan. And so one of his greatest claims to fame is the Great Wall, the famous Wall of Hadrian that he built uh, in order to separate the Roman Empire, the Greco-Roman Empire, uh, from the rest of the empire, this great wall that divided Greco-Roman civilization from the barbarian world that lay outside. And there are uh, fragments of that wall, ex quite extensive part of that wall, uh, that still survives in, uh, in, in Europe today. You can see it in Britain, and I show you an example of some of those uh, remains here on the right-hand side of the screen. That is of Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian uh, was also a great Philhellene, and you notice in that portrait that I just showed you that he wore a beard. And in fact, he's the first Roman emperor to wear a beard. Beards were not worn by Romans up to this time, but they were worn by Greeks. Uh, and we believe that he wore that beard in large part to look more Greek. We also know that although he wore a toga in public, uh, he was known for wearing the Greek hymation in private. Uh, and he did that, we think, in large part because of his uh, love for Greece and for Greek culture. He was so Philhellenic in his leanings that he received the nickname the Greekling. And we'll see as we look at his architecture the impact that his love of Greece had on that architecture. In fact, what I'd like to do today is to begin with the most Greek of Hadrian's buildings, a building that we think he may have designed himself because we also know that Hadrian was an amateur architect. Hadrian himself was an amateur architect. Uh, and we think he designed this very building, the so-called Temple of Venus and Roma. He was also particularly interested, by the way, in religious architecture. Most of his public building was religious architecture, temples, this being one of them. The Temple of Venus and Roma, a temple put up to Roma as the patron goddess of the city of Rome and to Venus as the patron goddess of the Roman family. And you'll remember uh, that Venus was a special favorite of Julius Caesar and of Augustus. Uh, that, and they, those two uh, thought of her as, their, as the special patron of the Julian family, 
So we also see Hadrian here uh, conjuring up, I think, his connections to uh, the earlier dictators and emperor, uh, Julius Caesar and Augustus, by his emphasis on Venus. So this temple to Venus in Roma, uh, you'll see that we don't have a precise date for this monument. We think it was put up sometime between 121 and 135. We know it was dedicated in 135. It seems to have been long in the making. So it's hard to, to categorize it as either an early or a mid or a late Hadrianic building because it does seem to have been in production for quite some time. I show you two plans of the Temple of Venus and Roma because there's controversy about which plan most uh, accurately reflects the original Hadrianic Temple. Uh, because we know the temple uh, was, while it was built under Hadrian and dedicated in 135, uh, we know that it burned down in a very serious fire in Rome in the late 3rd century AD and then was renovated by uh, a, an emperor whom we'll talk about later in the semester by the name of Maxentius, M-A-X-E-N-T-I-U-S. It was renovated by Maxentius in 307 AD. Uh, and uh, we think Maxentius kept quite closely to the original Hadrianic plan, uh, but we're not absolutely sure about that. So that some of the discrepancies that you see between these two plans may have to do with the discrepancies between the original building and uh, the eventual renovation. But uh, you will see that in the main, these two plans, and the one on the left-hand side of the screen is the one that's on your monument list that you have in front of you. The one on the right-hand side of the screen is the one in your Ward Perkins textbook. But if you look at its most outstanding features, you will see uh, that most of them are similar to one another, that the main features of these two buildings, uh, of these two plans, uh, are the same. Uh, and that is, and you should be immediately struck uh, by these plans, both of these plans, and how different they are from what we have characterized as the typical Roman temple. That typical Roman temple, with usually with a single cella, with a deep porch, with freestanding columns in that porch, with a facade orientation. Uh, this is very different indeed, no matter which of these two plans you look at, because you will see uh, that this large temple has a double cella, two cellas back to back, uh, and you see it in both plans, two cellas back to back. Well, the reason for that is obvious because it commemorates two divinities, uh, Venus and Roma, and each one needed to have a cella. But these are not cellas side by these are not cellas within a larger cella uh, located side by side as in the Capitoline Triad Temple, but rather two that are back to back two that are back to back. Now what this does is take away the facade orientation of the building and give us two facades in a sense, one on either side. Uh, that is also a, uh, so we see that in both of these. We also see that the columns uh, go all the way around the structure and so does the staircase go all the way around the structure. We see that in both plans and then there is a large precinct that also has <coughs> columns around it. Uh, I can also tell you, you can take on faith that this building also has a low podium. So what we see here is a temple that looks much more Greek than it looks Roman. In fact, as I said, it doesn't look anything like the typical Roman temples that we've been talking about today. Why is this? This has to do with the fact that Hadrian was a Philhellene, that he was enamored of Greek architecture, and that he opted in this case when he himself appears to have been the architect of this building. Hadrian, amateur architect, seems to have designed this building himself. Uh, we see that when he was left entirely to his own devices, he wanted to build a Greek temple in Rome, and that is exactly what he did. Now, also important vis-a-vis -vis this temple is location, location, location. This building is located uh, on the, at the edge of the Roman Forum, closest to the Colosseum, uh, and on the Velia. You'll remember the Velia, where the Arch of uh, Titus is located, uh, the Arch of Titus, and you'll remember that that was the area that the uh, Flavian dynasts chose uh, to build their buildings on uh, in order to raise to the ground Nero's earlier dom Domus Transitoria and build their own buildings in its place. So we see Hadrian continuing on in that same tradition returning to the Roman people land that had originally been theirs, that had been stolen by Nero, uh, by building, in this case, a religious structure uh, on that site instead. So that also extremely important. 
To get back for a moment to the plan, uh, we see again the major difference between these two versions is that in this case there is a flat back wall for each of the uh, individual cellars. For this one, a niche on either side. Niche is back to back almost kissing as you can see here. Uh, and then you can also see another difference is the walls are very elaborately scalloped. Uh, in this plan, which we can see in the Maxentian renovation that still exists, and I'll show it to you in a moment. Uh, but again, we're not sure if that was a Maxentian innovation in the early 4th century AD, those back-to-back uh, -back apses and scalloped walls, or whether they come from the original, Had or whether they re restore what was in the original Hadrianic building. I tend to prefer the one on the left because there is every evidence that we already have all of these features in Roman architecture. Think to the Flavian Palace on the Palatine, Domitian's Palace, uh, where we saw the scalloped walls in the Aula Regia, and where we certainly saw uh, these niches with vaults of heaven, uh, semi-dome, semi-vaults up above them. So everything was in place uh, to have that kind of structure, so it's certainly not inconceivable in the Hadrianic period. Here's a view of the Temple of Venus in Roma as it looks if you are standing atop the Colosseum and taking a picture back toward it. And this is very useful uh, because it shows you this is not a high podium. This is just uh, the, the difference in ground level once again, uh, ancient ground level being lower than modern ground level. And some of the, uh, the, 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 the structures that lay below originally of Nero's uh, Domus Transitoria, for example, that this building was built on. Here you can actually see the podium of the temple and you can see that it is very low uh, compared to what we're used to. We're looking back at one of those niches. You can see the semi-dome here uh, as well as the relationship of it to the Arch of Titus which, and the Velia, which one again, once again points out the fact uh, that we are uh, dealing here with a building that was put on property that had originally uh, been the location of Nero's Domus Transitoria. Here are three very useful views, one showing that same niche closer up uh, from the, taken from the Colosseum, one of those back-to-back -back niches as it looks today, and then this one over here, which is the other niche, uh, which is preserved inside uh, a later building that was transformed into a museum of the Forum Romanum at one point. We see it here, and you can see in both cases the semi-dome. You can see the concrete construction faced with brick. Uh, in this one, which is better preserved in large part because it was in, in, in part indoors, we can see the columns on either side of the niche, and we also see that scalloped wall that I described before, just like the Aula Regia with niches uh, flanked by columns, and you can see the beginning of a coffered vault. We're not absolutely sure it was barrel vaulted, but we think the building was barrel vaulted. We also see on the left, I remind you of the octagonal room designed by Riberius. Uh, for the um, Domitian's Palace on the Palatine uh, to underscore again the kinds of experiments that Riberius was making that had such an impact as we shall see today on Hadrian and his own architectural designs. Uh, you'll remember that room, you'll remember that it has a segmented vault, uh, you will remember that it's treated very much like sculpture, that it has niches, that it has niches within niches, windows within niches, doorways within niches, all of them done in an asymmetrical way uh, that makes the design particularly interesting. Riberius and his architecture are very influential on Hadrian. Uh, keep in mind that Hadrian, once Domitian, I mentioned this to you when we talked about Domitian's palace, once Domitian built that palace, it was the palace that all the emperors from that time to the end of late antiquity lived in. Hadrian was no exception. When he was in Rome, he lived in that palace, uh, and he was therefore seeing and experiencing uh, the shapes of the architectural shapes designed by Riberius on a daily basis. He liked that octagonal room in particular, uh, and the others like it in the villa, in the palace. And he was clearly it clearly had an impact on him, as we shall see. The last point I want to make about the Temple of Venus in Roma, by the way, has to do with materials. We have been talking about the increasing use of marble in Roman architecture. Under Augustus, marble from Luna or Carrara. Under Nero and the Flavians, marble from all over the world, from Asia Minor, from Africa, of all different colors. 
Hadrian, the Philhellene, returns to using Greek marble uh, for his buildings. And the Temple of Venus in Roma uh, is made of Proconetian marble, P-R-O-C-O-N-N, E-S-I-A-N, I think I got that right, Proconetian marble uh, that, um, that comes from Greece. It's a blue-veined marble. He was particularly fond of it, and he used it uh, for the Temple of Venus and Roma. I want to turn from the Temple of Venus and Roma to the much more famous temple that Hadrian constructed. If the Temple of Venus to Ro and Roma was to two gods, Venus and Roma, uh, the Hadrian, Hadrian's pantheon was to all the gods, which is what pantheon means, to all the gods, a temple to all the gods uh, that he built in Rome between 118 and 128 AD. You see a Google Earth image of it here. Uh, the Pantheon surrounded by, uh, the, by modern structures. It is one of the greatest masterpieces of architecture <laughs> of all times. Uh, in fact, if you were to ask a group of architectural experts to get, make a list of their ten, the, of the ten greatest buildings ever built, it's hard for me to believe that not every one of them would at least list somewhere in that list of ten the Pantheon, not only because it's a great building in its own right, but because it has had such a, an enormous impact on uh, architecture in Roman times, as we'll see in later lectures, but also on architecture in post-antique times, an extraordinarily influential building. And there are some, and I would be one of them, maybe I'd be the only one, I hope not, uh, who would list the Pantheon as the greatest building ever built by man or woman of any time in any place. Uh, and you can see as we look at it together today whether you think I come close or I'm way off the mark on that. But I believe vehemently uh, that it was the greatest building ever built. And it remains an extraordinary structure to see and to experience. You see it here. Oh, and by the way, although I mentioned that Hadrian was an amateur architect, uh, we don't know the name of the architect for the Pantheon. Do I think it was Hadrian? Absolutely not. Hadrian was not this good. He was an amateur architect, not a professional architect. This is an extraordinary work of art. He may have had some input. He undoubtedly did. Uh, because we're going to see that the Pantheon is at the same time complex and simple. Uh, it's also traditional and innovative. And what we're going to see Hadrian and his architect doing here and also doing at the villa at Tivoli is combining in an extraordinary way traditional Roman and innovative Roman architecture, concrete construction, and the original vocabulary of Greek <laughs> architecture, namely columns, combined in the same place. And he was highly influenced in this regard by his predecessor, Trajan. Think of the markets and forum of Trajan, the way in which we had combined in the same complex a traditional forum and a very innovative marketplace. We're going to see the same thing in the Pantheon. We're going to see the same thing at Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli. So Trajan, exerting a, a Trajan and Apollodorus of Damascus uh, exerting a very strong influence, as did Riberius, on uh, the architecture of Hadrian. Uh, again, this, this uh, Google Earth image is useful because it shows us the building in its modern environment. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that the uh, Pantheon in Rome uh, was part of a complex in antiquity, as most temples were, temples that were in sanctuaries, temples that were in fora. We've seen that in the course of the semester, that they usually did not stand in isolation, but were part of architectural complexes. We see that here. This model is very helpful in that regard, because it shows us that there was a rectangular forecourt, that that forecourt had covered colonnades on either side, that there was some sort of entranceway here, possibly an arch, possibly an altar also uh, to all the gods in front of the temple, uh, and then uh, the temple itself, the pantheon itself. Now, this model is also very useful in the sense that it gives you uh, an idea of what you actually would have seen if you had walked into uh, this complex, into this open rectangular space. Uh, and walked toward the, the Pantheon, what would you actually have seen? Well, all that you would have actually seen was the porch. The porch, which had an attic behind it, which screened uh, the cylindrical drum and the dome from the viewer. So if you were standing here, all you would have seen was this porch. Now, this porch is very traditional. 
It looks like other Roman temples, the fronts and facades of Roman temples that we've looked at before. It looks like other Greek temples, uh, because what you would have seen uh, was the pediment, a uh, column supporting that pediment. It was a typical Roman temple from the top front. Deep porch, freestanding columns in that porch. Single staircase, facade orientation. Very different from the Temple of Venus and Roma. Much more Roman looking. Uh, and then uh, I think, I, and then a high podium, a high podium, which we already mentioned, uh, the Temple of Venus in Roma did not have. That's what you would have seen as you were standing in front of it. You would have thought, well, this is you know very much in keeping uh, with other Roman temples. Uh, but uh, of course, there was a surprise uh, when one walked through the doors, and that is the very essence of Hadrianic architecture. Uh, the surprise that one gets when one actually goes from the outside of a building into the inside of a building. Before we do that, I just want to show you the back of the cylindrical, because this, this uh, traditional porch uh, shielded uh, a very innovative cylindrical drum supported by a hemispherical dome, as you can see here. Uh, the uh, construction technique, the same as we've seen uh, from the time of Augustus, from the time of the Temple of Mercury at Baia. The use of concrete construction faced with brick. It's more sophisticated here than it has ever been before, and we can see that the artists have, re the architect has relieved the severity of the structure by adding uh, three cornices, you can see them here, two of them at least here, there's another one down here, three cornices. And you can also see very interestingly uh, these brick arches, which tell us a great deal about Roman uh, building practice during this period, especially obviously for the use of concrete construction, because what those were used for is to help keep the uh, concrete from settling. After the, the wet concrete had been poured, uh, those arches keep it from settling until it dries. And then once it dries, uh, those arches are no longer needed because the building, the, the concrete walls support the building on their own, can support the dome on their own, and they're no longer needed. But of course, they're left there, and then they have a certain aesthetic uh, value in the aftermath. Uh, and so you can see very clearly here as you look at what is preserved, and the building is extremely well preserved, of the back of the building, uh, you can see uh, reference to that construction. Uh, these diagrams, both the plan, the plan of the structure, the cross section, and the diagram on the left hand side, also give us some very interesting and important information. Uh, they show us that the um, circular drum was internally half the height of the diameter. You can see that in the, uh, in the diagram on the left hand side of the screen. Uh, of the diameter of the structure and um, that it was surmounted by a hemispherical dome, the crown of which is uh, the, the, the exact distance, the same exact distance. So this was very carefully orchestrated uh, by the architect to achieve uh, what he needed to achieve here. Uh, you can also see, if you look at the plan, that again, uh, the, the, the predecessors for this are clearly the Frigidaria at Pompeii, the thermal bath at Baia, this round structure with the radiating apses, a very similar, but of course done in much, much grander scale. Now with regard to, um, with regard to, and this is the facade of the Pantheon, of course, as it looks today. With regard to how they made this happen, how they were able to take the small-scale Frigidaria, uh, the slightly larger Temple of Mercury, the larger still Domus Aurea of Nero, or the Domed Room and the Domus Transitoria, and turn it into the Pantheon, ultimately, has to do in part not only with the skill of the architects, has to do in part also with the increasing sophistication that we've been talking about quite consistently of the use of concrete uh, construction by the Romans, uh, but also has to do with the recipe for concrete. We haven't talked about the recipe for concrete since the time of Caligula, when we talked about the fact that he had made some adjustments. Well, Hadrian made some adjustments, or Hadrian and his architects made some adjustments as well. Uh, during Hadrian's reign, uh, and what they did was they, two things, they decreased the um, thickness, they decreased the thickness of the walls uh, from bottom to top, 
Uh, and they also did what Caligula had done before, but did it even, even more so by uh, mixing, using as an aggregate at the base of the dome, they used um, heavy, heavy stone, a basalt, a very heavy, thick basalt. But when they got toward the top, they mixed, or the idea was when they got toward the top, they would mix in as an aggregate uh, a porous pumice, which was much, much lighter. And that's essentially how they achieved um, their goals. Now, before I talk about the exterior of the structure and, and take you through the building, I want to mention one very interesting exchange between Hadrian and Trajan's architect, Apollodorus of Damascus. You'll remember that I said that the Temple of Venus in Roma, we think, was designed by Hadrian himself. And at one point, Hadrian, Apollodorus was still alive, and at one point, and highly respected, and at one point, Hadrian went to Apollodorus to ask him for his thoughts on the designs that Hadrian was doing for the plans that Hadrian was doing for the Temple of Venus in Roma, which tells us, you wondered where I got, where I, how we know that Hadrian was an amateur architect, it's because of this passage, because it tells us that Hadrian was doing some designing and that he was designing the Temple of Venus and Roma. And we fortunately have the, the, uh, the uh, Roman senator of Eastern birth, Dio Cassius, D-I-O, new word C-A-S-S-I-U-S, -S -S Dio Cassius, a Roman senator of Eastern birth who wrote a history of Rome in the third century, gives us, the third century A.D., gives us uh, an account of this interaction between Hadrian and Apollodorus of Damascus. And although I don't like to read to you, I am going to read to you from this quote uh, because it is so critical for our understanding both of the Pantheon and for Hadrian's villa at Tivoli. So bear with me as I read this, uh, you know, a bit longish um, quote. So Cassius Dio, Cassius Dio tells us, and I quote, Hadrian first drove into exile and then put to death Apollodorus, who had carried out many of Trajan's building projects. The pretext given for Hadrian's action was that Apollodorus had been guilty of some serious offense. But the truth is that when Trajan was at one time consulting with Apollodorus about a certain problem connected with his buildings, that is Trajan's buildings, the architect said to Hadrian, so this seems to have been before even Hadrian uh, became emperor, the architect said to Hadrian, who had interrupted them with some advice, go away and draw your pumpkins. You know nothing about these problems. For it so happened that Hadrian was at that time priding himself on some sort of drawing. When he became emperor, that is when Hadrian became emperor, he remembered the insult and refused to put up with, Apollo and refused to put up with Apollodorus's outspokenness. He sent him the plan for the temple of Venus and Roma in order to demonstrate that it was possible for a great work to be conceived without Apollodorus's help. And asked him, that is Hadrian asked Apollodorus, if he thought the building was well designed. Apollodorus sent a reply saying that as far as the temple of Venus and Roma was concerned, it should have been placed in a higher position. It should have had a high podium, not a low podium, according to Apollodorus, who goes on to say, with regard to the cult images, Apollodorus, uh, Apollodorus goes on to say, with regard to the cult images, they were made on a scale which was too great for the height of the cella. For if the goddesses should wish to stand up and leave the temple, he said, they would be unable to do so. When he wrote all of this so bluntly, Hadrian was both irritated and deeply pained. He had the man slain. Now, the pumpkins, what's critical about this, it tells us two things that are absolutely essential in our understanding of Hadrianic architecture. One, that Hadrian was doing designing on his own, that he was an amateur architect, and he seems to be very much involved in the design of the temple in v of Venus in Roma. It also tells us that Hadrian was making some drawings uh, of pumpkin domes. What are pumpkin domes? Well, pu pumpkin domes are, uh, domes are undoubtedly segmented domes. They are just the kind of dome that Riberius did for the uh, octagonal rooms in the Palatine Palace, rooms that Hadrian was exposed to by living in that palace himself, obviously fond of them, liked them, 
uh, started to draw his own pumpkins, and we're going to see that, that those pumpkins, well, we don't have a pumpkin dome in the Pantheon, as we'll see, probably fortunately. Uh, but uh, we do have them at Hadrian's Villa. And so, again, very critical uh, for you to be aware of this interesting exchange, very momentous exchange between Hadrian and Apollodorus. We see here the facade of the Pantheon as it looks today. You have to think away this very attractive, but nonetheless uh, mars the view of the, of the facade of the Pantheon that was put up in the Renaissance, uh, and you have to imagine the building now stands in isolation without its colonnades and without its forecourt, uh, so you have to try to imagine them. But you can see how very well preserved the Pantheon is. Uh, the ground level has shifted, so we don't see the very tall podium that was once there, although there have been some excavations around it that demonstrate that it is indeed there, or part of it is indeed there. Uh, but we can see the columns across the front. We can see an inscription. We can see the pediment and the attic. And this is a good view because although you see the dome peeping up a little bit on the top, it gives you some sense of when you stood in the colonnade walking toward it, uh, the, the, the forecourt walking toward it, that you would have only seen essentially the most traditional part of the building, and that is the columns supporting the pediment with the dome behind. This is a detail of the inscription of the building. Uh, we can also see the columns. You can see that they are gray granite. I have a better view in a moment. Gray granite with white marble uh, capitals. The inscription is fascinating. It tells us that M. Agrippa, Marcus Agrippa, that's the famous Marcus Agrippa, the childhood friend, confidant, son-in-law, first-hand man, one-time heir uh, to Augustus, Marcus Agrippa, L.F., Lucius Filius, the son of Lucius, C.O.S., Cos, uh, consul, Consul tertium for the third time, fake it, made it. This tells us Marcus Agrippa, consul for the third time, son of Lucius, made it, made the Pantheon. What's that all about? Marcus Agrippa lived in the age of Augustus. Well, we know there was an earlier Pantheon on this site that Marcus Agrippa was responsible for commissioning. Marcus Agrippa, like uh, Augustus, commissioned a lot of buildings in Rome. He also commissioned them in the provinces. We'll look at some of those when we go out to the provinces. Marcus Agrippa, a major building pro program in Rome, including a pantheon, a temple to all the gods. And we don't, that pantheon no longer exists, although there have been some excavations that have discovered some of it underneath uh, the current building. Uh, but it stood on this very site, and we know uh, from a literary description that it had a caryatid porch, which is perhaps not surprising in the context of Augustan architecture. Remember the caryatids in the Forum of Augustus uh, that we looked at earlier in the term. So we know that Marcus Agrippa actually built Rome's first pantheon, both his first temple to the gods on this very site. When Hadrian built his own pantheon on the same site, he decided to piously reference uh, the earlier building of Marcus Agrippa, telling us that Marcus Agrippa made this, made a building that originally stood on this site, which he is basically very modestly saying he restored. Of course, this building that he made has nothing to do, undoubtedly, with the Pantheon in Rome. It's a very different and much more sophisticated building, but it was a very um, modest thing to do. But I think there was a, uh, you know, a method to his madness in the sense that he, un he, he was underscoring by so doing his relationship once again to Augustus. Uh, which was obviously very important for him to do. But this inscription confused a lot of scholars for a long time, who actually called this originally a, um, an Augustan building. You can see the pediment up above. You can see all the holes there. Those are the attachment marks for sculpture that would have, stood in, that would have been located in this pediment that no longer survives. Here's another view showing the gray, the light gray granite columns, the white Corinthian capitals, all of these magnificently carved, very high quality artists, uh, architects and artisans here. By the way, I forgot to mention when we talked about the Temple of Venus in Rome and the use of Greek marble, that Hadrian not only brought in Greek marble, but he brought in Greek marble cutters, marble carvers, uh, who were responsible for working on these. So he wanted the very best, those who were most familiar with carving Greek marble, uh, to be used for his buildings. And they were undoubtedly used for this one as well. Uh, and we can see the depth of the porch, I think, also from this view of the Corinthian columns of that porch. <coughs> 
It's very hard in a classroom in New Haven, even with outstanding slides, uh, to be able to give you a sense of the experience that one has, of the surprise that one has as one walks through the door of the Pantheon. Uh, we see uh, the doors opened here. They are bronze doors. They are original do do doors uh, from this extremely well-preserved structure. And the reason that it is so well-preserved is because, like other buildings in Rome, it was reused in later times as a church primarily uh, with a wonderful name, Santa Maria Rotunda, St. Mary, the Rotund Mary, essentially, uh, which is perfectly uh, perfectly chosen uh, for a building with a giant rotunda with a great cylindrical drum uh, that the building has. Uh, we see those doors opened up here and as one walks through this very traditional porch through the original bronze doors into the interior, uh, one is, is struck by the extraordinary nature of the interior of the Pantheon which you see over here. And all you're looking at here is the uppermost part uh, with, the, uh, with the dome essentially because, and the reason is because it is near, the hu even the human eye, both eyes, can't take in uh, the, the extent of this interior all in one glance. And even if one uses the widest of wide le angle lenses, uh, you get a tremendous amount of distortion uh, and you can't really take the whole thing in at once, which is, it's, it makes it extraordinary. And one has to rely instead on uh, this painting by Panini that shows you the grandeur beneath the dome, that gives you a better idea than any image I can show you, however professional, of what the interior of the Pantheon actually looks like. Uh, and you can see in this Panini painting uh, the wonderful marble revetment, the marble floor, uh, the, uh, the, the dome uh, with its coffers. There are um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five rows, yeah, five rows of 28 coffers each, 140 coffers in all. Uh, they were likely gilded in antiquity. You see that there is an oculus through which light streams uh, down onto that gilding, down onto the marble incrustation. The marble incrustation, by the way, extremely well preserved. This is about our best example of ancient Roman marble. Not all of it is ancient, but a good part, portion of it is, and it gives you a very good sense of what some of these marble uh, buildings would have looked like in antiquity. And I show you a detail of some of the original marble revetment over here. And this is what those Pompeians wished their walls actually were. Uh, beautiful marbles of all different colors brought from all different parts of the world. So even though Hadrian chose Proconetian marble for his Temple of Venus in Rome, his Greek building, which we really need to think of as a kind of Greek import uh, for this more Roman building, he is following in the footsteps of Nero and the Flavians and using multicolored marble both for the revetment on the wall and the marble pavement down below. Uh, most of this building, again, it's very well preserved, uh, is its original, is the original structure, the original columns, the original pilasters, uh, still extremely well preserved in the Pantheon. Uh, because it was used over time as a church, there are lots of accoutrements uh, that one would expect. Uh, in a church, uh, various saints and niches and so on and so forth. So much of the sculpture uh, is, is, is from the, a later period. And it even served, uh, has served as a burial place for famous uh, Italians, uh, not the least of which was Raphael, the famous Renaissance painter who, who you remember left a graffito when he went down uh, into the uh, subterranean chambers of Nero's Domus Aurea. He was buried here and his tomb is one of the high points for most visitors uh, to this structure. You see it here. Uh, it dwarfs to most people's minds the tomb of Victor Emmanuel, uh, whom you see over here on the left-hand side of the screen. But note all of that Roman symbolism, you know, the eagle with outstretched wings and the Amazonian pelta and so on. All of those symbols of Roman power uh, still very much um, used by <coughs> dynasts, modern dynasts, like Victor Emmanuel. The dome of the Pantheon had the largest diameter of any dome uh, up to this point. Uh, we know that it was the diameter of the Pantheon <clears throat> is 142 feet. <clears throat> and uh, if we compare it to the other large dome in Rome, that of St. Peter's, uh, we find that 
the Pantheon Dome still surpasses St. Peter's. St. Peter's is 139 feet in diameter, so just a bit smaller. Now, any of you who have been both in the Pantheon and in St. Peter's will probably say to me, wait a minute here. Uh, the Dome of St. Peter's actually looks larger when you stand in front underneath it, and I show you a view of that dome here. The reason it does look a bit larger is the Dome of St. Peter's is taller. So volumetrically, it looks bigger. Uh, and it visually looks bigger, but it isn't in terms of its diameter. In diameter, the dome of the Pantheon is still uh, the largest dome in the city of Rome. And as you look at this dome and compare it to St. Peter's, one can't help but think, and think back to uh, Domitian and his Dominus et Deus and his vaults and so on and so forth, the whole idea being uh, having the dome of heaven over one's head. I think one can't help but uh, think when one looks at this that uh, there may be some reference here both to the orb of the earth and to the dome of heaven and it is certainly uh, a, um, a appropriate symbol for a, a building that honors all the gods. I think it's important to, um, to at this juncture to say something about or to compare uh, the most important Greek temple, the Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens, with the most significant Roman temple, the Pantheon, uh, to see that we have really come from an exterior to an interior architecture. Then in the case of the Parthenon, 5th century BC, Athenian Acropolis, uh, they are thinking primarily of a building that interacts with the rock of the Acropolis and with the urban landscape. Uh, and in other contexts, these Greek buildings interact directly with nature. That's the way the Greeks thought about their buildings, essentially as an exterior structure. And we see the Romans following suit in their emphasis on facade, the facade of temples in their own religious architecture. But with the Pantheon, that changes. Yes, it does have a facade, it does have a pediment in the front. It does have a traditional porch. So that's a nod uh, to traditional temple architecture. But once you go through that porch into the structure and see that great uh, cylindrical drum, the hemispherical dome, the light streaming through, uh, you're in this, this totally new interior world that has no precedent in early Roman architecture and that had a huge impact on later Byzantine architecture, medieval, especially Byzantine architecture in particular. Go to Istanbul and see Hagia Sophia or the Blue Mosque. Uh, they owe everything uh, to the dome of the Pantheon. So we see this final, this real tra transition here, a transition also in building materials from stone uh, to concrete construction. A few more views uh, of this, um, of the interior of the, uh, of the dome of the Pantheon. These are very dramatic in black and white. Uh, and you can see it's, it's just, if you're in Rome and have the time, it's a great deal of fun to go and look at the Pantheon at different times of day because the light has such an impact on uh, what the interior looks like. You know, go, go in there in the morning, take a look, then go out, have a long lunch, glass of wine, come back later uh, and see, see what has happened. And it's also fun to be there when it rains. Um, it's interesting to have the rain come down and collect. There is a drain, but it doesn't always work all that well. So I uh, see water collecting on the edges of the floor uh, in this extraordinary building. Uh, one last view. I love taking v views of the, I mean, I, take z I have zillions of images that I've taken, including this one, of the interior of the uh, Pantheon at all different times of day. But I think it, it behooves us to notice and to say that uh, in, in this kind of new interior architecture, this architecture of interior surprise, uh, it's not only the vault itself, it's not only the concrete construction or the marble revetment. Light plays a, a, a very important role. And we've seen light playing a very important role from the times of the, of the, Domus, of, of the Domus Italica uh, up through, and the sanctuary at Terracina, for example, up to uh, where we are today, but never more important than here. Light that streams through the oculus, light that is used not only to illuminate this building and illuminate it extremely well, but also to create drama, to create drama. And you have to imagine uh, it even more dramatic when the, when the uh, coffers were gilded uh, and when the uh, ma marble down below may have been even brighter still. Uh, the marble pavement, by the way, which I didn't show you, is also extremely well preserved. So this light, this light uh, plays a very important and dramatic role in this new, highly developed interior architecture. And, uh, 
I, I know, I personally know of no other building that one can visit and experience that gives you a better sense than this one of the divine presence on earth. Whether it's one god, multi-gods, as we're honored here, you really get a sense of spirituality when you stand in this extraordinary uh, temple and really do get a sense of the divine presence, I think, on earth. I mentioned that the Pantheon uh, has, has spawned lots of, clo you know, as, as lots of buildings have been cloned from the Pantheon, both in ancient times, and I'll show you a couple of examples later in the semester, but also in more modern times. There are lots of examples. Wolsey Hall, for example, here on campus is a kind of a Pantheon. Uh, but uh, look, look at uh, the most, the most uh, obvious example in the United States is uh, the not only Monticello, but also Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia. The rotunda at the University of Virginia, which you see here, is clearly based exactly on the Pantheon. Thomas Jefferson, a great uh, fan of ancient architecture, his library, his personal library has lots of books <laughs> on Roman architecture. But I love, you know, when you look at a view of the rotunda and the lawn at the University of Virginia, I taught my first teaching job was at UVA, I taught there for three years. Uh, but um, but uh, when you look at this when you look at this building uh, the the lawn at UVA with the rotunda you can't help but wonder if Thomas Jefferson didn't know uh, that the Pantheon in Rome had that forecourt because the the, the rotunda faces the, the wrong way faces this way but nonetheless he's got behind it uh, in, in his own design uh, this extraordinary rectangular court that does conjure up uh, exactly what the Pantheon looked like in Rome. A few very quick uh, views of the Pantheon. I just hate to let it go, uh, but just some quick views of the Pantheon. Uh, one of the best ways of seeing it, it's surrounded by not only a, a wonderful piazza, which is a great place to eat gelato or have a glass of wine, uh, but uh, there are, you can, you can um, encounter it from a number of narrow streets, and that whole element of surprise is still there. You know, you're walking along the street, and wow, all of a sudden, uh, there it is in front of you, and you can see that very well here as you begin to get a glimpse of it. With regard to eating around the Pantheon, I recommend one of my absolute favorite restaurants in Rome, which is... Uh, easy to remember because it's Fortunato al Pantheon. You see it over here with its um, wonderful outdoor space and its white, uh, white um, umbrellas. Uh, right across from the Pantheon, directly across, is a McDonald's. Uh, I never, you know, the Golden Arches are really very much like a Roman aqueduct, don't you think? Uh, so references, I told you there are residences everywhere of Rome. Don't eat it, you know, you can eat a McDonald's anytime. Go to, go to the other one, um, much more interesting. And it has the best, I've never had this anywhere else, it has um, a veal scallopini al gorgonzola, with gorgonzola. Very thin a layer of gorgonzola, delicious. Uh, I also told you I was going to uh, keep you abreast of the latest on gelato in Rome. We've talked about Tre Scalini, so I just wanted to show you Della, pa Della Pana. If you're standing at the Pantheon restaurant, look to the right. You're going to see Della Palma, P-A-L-M-A. -A. It's uh, of the four best. Actually, I think it's the fourth. It's not my absolute favorite, but if you like... Uh, it's a little bit more Americanized, as you can see from this selection. Notice their Mars Bar Specialita, uh, as well as some of their other flavors. My favorite, personal favorite, is Zabayone, which you see over here, but just to whet your appetite early in the morning. I want to move in the, in the um, 20 minutes or so that remain, I would like to move uh, from the Pantheon in Rome to Hadrian's home. Not his home in Rome, which, as we've mentioned, was the <coughs> uh, palace of Domitian on the Palatine Hill, but his Rome at Tivoli, his, uh, his villa at Tivoli. Tivoli, ancient Tibor, we've talked about Tivoli many times before, where the marble, the uh, travertine quarries are located. Tiv Tivoli is about a, well, I don't know, 40 minute drive from Rome today, kind of high speed drive from Rome today. Uh, but in antiquity, longer, obviously, but not inaccessible from Rome. It was Hadrian, obviously, had no problems getting there in ancient Roman times. It's an extraordinary place, uh, and Hadrian, it was, a, it was a place that Hadrian used as a kind of incubator for his architectural ideas. And it's highly likely that many of the, of the, of the buildings that we see there were designed in part by him, especially those famous pumpkin domes, because we're going to see that a number of these buildings do indeed have 
pumpkin domes designed under the influence of the architecture of Liberius. It's an amazing villa. It is the most extensive villa preserved from the Roman world and likely the most grand of all the Roman villas. And if we think back to Nero's palace in Rome, what made Nero's palace in Rome so scandalous uh, was the fact that it was located in downtown Rome. Uh, but if you compare Nero's palace uh, to, <coughs> to Hadrian's uh, villa at Tivoli, there's no comparison between the two. Hadrian's villa at Tivoli is much more extensive. It has much more extraordinary buildings from the architectural standpoint. Uh, and it was decorated even more opulently with a wide variety of sculpture, mosaics, and paintings. It was clearly an extraordinary place. And if, if Trajan's forum was, in a sense, a microcosm of the extent of the empire under Trajan, I like to think of Hadrian's villa uh, as uh, the empire under Hadrian, uh, the empire that he traveled around so many times. And I show you in the upper right a map of the Roman Empire. All of that orange area is the area that was under Rome's aegis uh, at the time of Trajan and into the years of Hadrian. And if you look closely, you will see three colored lines, a yellow, a blue, and a red line. Those are Hadrian's travels around the empire, and it shows you how extensive they were. He went everywhere. Why? Because he loved to travel. He just loved to travel. Uh, but he also went in order to take a look at uh, provincial affairs at first hand. Now, everywhere he went, he either he himself paid for buildings that were erected, or more often than that, uh, buildings were put up by local uh, local magistrates and so on, local cities, uh, in honor of Hadrian, uh, in order to try to get a favor out of him or just to honor him on his visit. Some of these were rushed, you know, put up in, in a rush job in order to uh, be there when he arrived on the scene. So we see this incredible array of building activity. Uh, during this period, and we will see that reflected as we make our way, um, beginning already next week, make our way into the provinces, we will begin to see some very interesting Hadrianic buildings in those provinces that reflect uh, what he was doing elsewhere or in Rome. But what we see here, what we see at the villa is fascinating because all of us were just back from break. Some of you did some traveling. We know that traveling expands all of our horizons. We go someplace experientially we're different than we were before by what we see and what we experience. And we also, uh, maybe not in this new economic climate, but at least in the past, we all tended to pick up souvenirs, you know, a T-shirt here and a whatever there, handbag there. Uh, and, um, and we bring those back uh, to remind us, to give, remind us to make us, you know, have memories of, of the wonderful trip that we took. Well, Hadrian did that as well. He collected souvenirs. But because of his own wealth and because he had the imperial treasury behind him, he could, he could collect buildings as souvenirs, essentially. So when Hadrian traveled and saw what he liked, what he did was he came back uh, to this laboratory, this architectural laboratory that he had at Tivoli, uh, and he either created, some of these were probably designed by him, others by his architects, he created a series of buildings uh, that were in a sense souvenirs of his travels, either exact duplicates of things he saw or variations on those themes. And it makes these buildings particularly fascinating to look at. The, uh, the, the Villa of Hadrian was, uh, had three, three, essentially three building phases, an early, a middle, and a late. Uh, they span the entire, uh, entire um, reign of Hadrian. Uh, this, this villa was clearly Hadrian's hobby as well as his home, and if he hadn't died in 138, he would have undoubtedly continued to build here. So these buildings go up throughout the course of Hadrian's reign. I show you a view from the air of the villa as it looks today. You can see uh, that there are a series of very attractive pools of water interspersed with architecture. Uh, if we look at a plan of the villa, you will see that it is different than any other villa we've seen before in that uh, these buildings are actually kind of casually, almost in an ad hoc way, arranged around nature to interact with nature. We don't see the axiality and the symmetry that is so characteristic of so much 
of Roman architecture. They kind of meander along, as you might expect architectural experiments to, man, uh, to meander. And it has everything there, not only pools, but a wide variety of buildings that I'm going to show you fairly fleetingly. Uh, this great island villa over here, uh, the Piazza Doro, Doro, or the Golden Plaza. Uh, the, um, the two sets of baths, a large bath and a small bath. You also see a stadium here, hairpin shape, that I'm not going to return to. The Canopus, another pool. This was so complete that it even had its own Hades, its own hell, uh, in the villa. Everything was here. Hadrian left no stone unturned. I want to show you in fairly quick succession examples of the most interesting buildings of these uh, tourist souvenirs uh, that Hadrian brings back from his travels. The first I'd like to show you is the so-called Temple of Venus, which belongs to the latest building phase at the villa, 133 to 138. This is Hadrian the Philhellene once again, just as we saw him at the Temple of Venus and Roma. He goes to the Greek island of Knidos, K-N-I-D-O-S the Greek island of Knidos, on which there was the most famous round temple of Venus, with the most famous Greek statue of Venus, uh, a statue by the great Greek sculptor Praxiteles. Lots of people went to see it, and interestingly enough, it was this, uh, this um, temple and the statue uh, excavated a number of decades ago by a woman, a female archaeologist with the perfect name Iris Love for the goddess of love. That was really her name, destined uh, to go excavate uh, the, uh, the uh, temple of the goddess of love on the Greek island of Knidos. Hadrian goes there. He's enraptured by what he sees. He builds at his villa an exact replica, an exact replica of this Greek round temple. Uh, you can see it's the Doric order. You can see it supports triglyphs and metopes. And then in the center, uh, a statue of Venus, unfortunately now headless and armless. Uh, that's a cast. The original is in the museum on the site. You see it uh, in the museum on the site over here, uh, based on Praxiteles' earlier uh, uh, statue. There are lots of copies of this famous Praxitelian statue. We see another one here in the Vatican uh, that's more complete, gives you a better sense of what it looked like. But again, here are the Doric columns and the triglyphs of Menifee. So the most important point for you, an exact replica in this particular case. The most extraordinary of these uh, sort of architectural conceits, these giant uh, tourist souvenirs that Hadrian brings back from his travels to his villa at Tivoli, is the so-called Canopus at Hadrian's Villa, my personal favorite, the Canop Canopus at Hadrian's Villa, which you see on your monument, list, also dating to the latest period, 133 to 138 AD. It is meant to conjure up, in this case, not Greece, but Egypt, uh, a canal, the Canopus in Egypt, that was a tributary of the Nile. Uh, and we know that you could travel from Alexandria to a small town called Canopus by means of this canal. And that is what is meant to be conjured up here. The city of Canopus had in it a uh, temple to the Egyptian god Serapis, S-E-R-A-P-I-S, Serapis, who was the healing god. And people came from all around the world to be healed at the temple of Serapis. It was also well known uh, as a place with a wonderful amusement park. Uh, and we think that although Hadrian seems to have gone there uh, in part to go to the sanctuary of Serapis, he also appears uh, to have gone there because it was also an amusement park. And this is where we get into the personal love triangle of Hadrian. Hadrian was married uh, to a woman by the name of Sabina, a very beautiful woman, but she does look kind of dour. Uh, in this uh, portrait on the right-hand side of the screen. So perhaps we don't blame him uh, for taking up with what must have been the most beautiful boy in all of antiquity, uh, a youth by the name of Antinous, A-N-T-I-N-O-U-S. Antinous, whom Hadrian met on his travels in Asia Minor, smitten with the boy, uh, and they became constant companions thereafter. Uh, but unfortunately, Antinous, while still very young, died by drowning where else but the Nile in Egypt, also on these travels. They, they went to Canopus together, by the way, to the amusement park. 
uh, but poor Antinous died by drowning in the Nile. No one knows exactly what happened. Was it an accident? Some say that he may have given his life to save Hadrian's. We don't really know. That's never been sorted out as to exactly what happened to this, love, this, what, this wonderful and beautiful young man. Um, but he died by drowning in the Nile, which made the Nile a particularly poignant spot uh, for Hadrian, who appears to have recreated it here at his villa. He also went on to found, this is one of the reasons this has inspired so many <laughs> designers your own Roman cities project, not only the relationship between Hadrian and Antinous and this love triangle with Sabina, uh, but also because Hadrian went around the empire and founded one Antonopolis after another. There were tons of Ant Antonopolises uh, all around Rome, and he put up statues of Antinous in every possible guise of every possible god, the major Roman gods and, some of, and, and all the minor uh, Roman gods as well. And there are lots of statues of Antinous. This is another one that was found at the villa, not at this pool, although, the, although it might have been, given that the inspiration was Egypt. Uh, this shows him in Egyptian guise with the Egyptian headdress uh, and uh, covered, covering all that wonderful curly hair uh, for which he was so well known, uh, but nonetheless Antinous as a pharaoh uh, from Hadrian's villa. Back to the Canopus, you see the pool, you see it has columns on one side. These columns are, had a sculpture interspersed, and here Greece comes back to the fore because many of these statues here were also based on ancient Greek prototypes, so we see uh, this interesting um, eclecticism here, a pool based on Egypt with some Egyptianizing statuary, but also interspersed with Greek statues based on famous Greek prototypes. Most important to us from the architectural standpoint, the straight lintel and the arcuated lintel used here for the Canopus. We saw that in second style Roman wall painting. We're beginning to see it now in built architecture. It becomes a particular favorite of Hadrian's, uh, and we're going to see it elsewhere in the Roman province is under Hadrian. Uh, the influence again of Egypt and also in this case also of Rome. Two river gods that seem to have decorated the Canopus. Uh, this one leaning on a figure of a sphinx. So this is clearly the Nile River. This one leaning on uh, the she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus. Clearly the Tiber. So once again, very eclectic sculptural program. The Caryatids were there too, lining one side of the pool of the Canopus. You see them over here now in the museum. Extremely well preserved, based on the original 5th century BC Caryatids on the Acropolis. So Hadrian's Philhellenism coming to the fore again. You'll remember Augustus copied these same Caryatids for his form, reduced scale. Hadrian's are in full length, full scale, same scale as those in Greece. And the major difference between Hadrian's Caryatids and Augustus's, Augustus's like the Erechtheon where the original porch of the maidens in is in a public building, in the case of Hadrian, a private villa, using these caryatids at a private villa. Here you see them lining one side of the Canopus, flanked on either side by satyrs, the same kinds of fellows we saw in the Dionysiac mystery paintings. And then, just so that we don't forget Egypt, uh, this wonderful uh, representation of a statue of a of a crocodile uh, that was surely placed in the center of the pool, peeping out uh, of the water, just so that we make sure we remember it's the Nile. Uh, and I can trace my whole professional career uh, sitting on this crocodile, because I've, every time I'm there, including even now, I pose on that crocodile. But I, I do it in part because I think it's fun, uh, <clears throat> but also to encourage there, there are two pictures that I really like students to send me when they travel to Italy. One is of them sitting on the crocodile at Hadrian's Villa, and another is them on the stepping stones at Pompeii. So I hope if you do go that you will do that. My favorite one, and I can't find it, unfortunately, because this is pre-digital, was a, a student who sent me himself on this with his shades on. But then he had put a cigarette in the mouth of the crocodile, <laughs> unlit cigarette. It was really a, a cool picture. I've got to find that someday. Uh, the uh, plan of the Canopus over here uh, shows us what we've looked at, the uh, straight and arcuated lintel here, the crocodile on this <laughs> side, the caryatids on that side, uh, and then over here at the end, uh, the temple of Serapis, because they were trying to recreate again this canal uh, that led uh, from Alexandria to Canopus, and at the end, of course, the temple of Serapis, the healing god, that was located at Canopus. But you can see as well as I by looking at the plan 
uh, this uh, curved structure over here, which we'll see is made out of concrete. But this is no Egyptian building. This is a very modern uh, Roman-looking building. And I show it to you here on the end of the canal. This is called the so-called Serapium, or the Temple of Serapis. And you can see it has one of Hadrian's pumpkin domes. It is very likely that it was designed by, by by him, by Hadrian. Uh, and we see it made out of concrete. We can see it has niches. It actually served as a fountain with very deep niches from which there would have emanated a water display. And then uh, you can see a concrete dome uh, up above with those segmented flat and concave, alternating flat and concave segments that look like a, a gourd or a pumpkin dome, probably designed by Hadrian himself. Here's a closer view showing you the same. Baths, there are two baths at Hadrian's Villa. Uh, one of them, um, I show you the, only the large baths here of Hadrian's Villa, which dates to the early phase of 125 to 133. I'm not going to say too much about these. I'm not going to show you the plan. But just to make the point that the villa has not one, but two baths, and they are gargantuan. Look at the size of this. Look at the torus here in relationship to the so-called large baths. This is a private bathing establishment, but it shows you that Hadrian has learned well uh, from Trajan. This is a, if Trajan's forum was the mother of all forums, this is the mother of all private bath buildings that we see uh, at uh, Hadrian's villa. And we also see the expert way in which these architects use concrete construction. It's extraordinary. Look at these vaults. Uh, vaults that are springing, just as they did in Hadrian's um, market hall uh, in the markets in Rome, springing from a groin vaults that spring from a bracket uh, rather than from a column or a pilaster. And look at the way in which they've been able to open up this wall, dematerialize the wall with very large windows, very sophisticated use of concrete construction. Here a detail of the groin vault springing from the bracket uh, with the um, stucco decoration that you can also see. Very quickly, I also want to show you um, the, uh, the so-called Piazza d'Oro, or the Golden Plaza, which dates also to the early phase of the Villa of Hadrian at Tivoli, 125 to 133. You can see just by looking at its plan that it's interesting. It was used as a, an audience hall when Hadrian greeted important visitors at the villa. Uh, if you look at the entrance vestibule, it's octagonal just like the octagonal room of Rabirius uh, with a pumpkin vault, then a great open rectangular space, fairly traditional, surrounded by columns. And then over here, the audience hall, or aula, A-U-L-A, itself. This is, ex this is an amazing structure. And what makes the aula particularly interesting and important is like the Pantheon, it combines traditional and innovative architecture. It combines concrete construction with traditional vocabulary of Greek architecture, namely columns. There is an annular vault over here. Uh, you can see that the walls of this structure undulate. But this undulation is particularly interesting because the walls are not made out of concrete. Uh, we'll see that the walls are made out of columns. Here I show you uh, a, a cutaway axonometric view of the aula, where you can see these undulating walls making a kind of cruciform shape. But you can see that they are supported by columns. So again, this fascinating uh, bringing together of the traditional vocabulary of Greek architecture, namely columns, with a concrete pumpkin dome on top use of innovative, uh, of the traditional vocabulary of architecture in an innovative way. One might even call this an example of the so-called Baroque trend in Roman antiquity, which we'll be talking about increasingly. And I want you to be aware that, you, uh, that it happens here. Just very quickly, the very sculptural vestibule entranceway, so inspired by Rabirius of the Piazza d'Oro, uh, showing uh, this concrete construction with a pumpkin dome. Uh, and then a detail of some of the columns along that undulating, that curved or undulating wall that are still preserved in the aula. Uh, I, I want to show you also, lastly, at Hadrian's Villa, uh, the so-called uh, Teatro Maritimo, the maritime theater, which dates to the very earliest of the phases, 118 to 128. 
Uh, this was the building. Uh, Hadrian started with this first because this is what he wanted most of all, which was an island villa within a villa, a place where he could really go if he wanted to be alone, even at his own villa. And one can imagine him escaping here uh, with an Antinous uh, by his side. Uh, we see that island villa here. It's a round structure. Uh, in order to protect himself, once he crossed the drawbridge, he has placed a moat around the, uh, around the island villa, within a villa. But if you look at the plan of that island villa, you would think that Riberius was still alive, you know, in the sense of that, that compass work that we saw Riberius doing in the private wing of the Domus Augustana, playing off convex against concave. Uh, but the difference between this and what Riberius did is this combines in this very exciting way concrete walls with, uh, and concrete domes with columns. Uh, we see that same combination here. Here's a view of what the island within the, uh, the Teatro Maritimo looks like today. Here's the island surrounded by the moat. Uh, and you can see this wonderful combination of brick face concrete construction with columns. But if you look at the columns, you will see that they follow uh, the curvature of the foundation of the wall. So this, again, combination of traditional and innovative architecture. Another view of the moat of a colonnade with ionic capitals that surrounds the whole. And then another view uh, of the island part uh, with this wonderful interaction of columnar and concrete architecture. Lastly, I just want to show you the uh, tomb of Hadrian and make a very few points about it. The tomb of Hadrian, the famous mausoleum of Hadrian, better known as the Castel San Angelo in Rome, uh, was put up at the end of Hadrian's reign uh, between 135 and his death in 138 and consecrated by his successor, Antoninus Pius. It is located in a part of Rome that we have not explored thus far because very few ancient buildings survive from that part of the city. We are looking at an excellent Google Earth uh, view of the Tiber River. You will notice uh, the uh, Piazza Navona over here, the great stadium over here. And we should be able to see the Pantheon, but it may be cut off as is uh, the, um, in this view, as is the, uh, tomb of, of Augustus, which is located over here. But we can see well the Castle San Angelo of um, Hadrian's mausoleum, fronted by a bridge over the Tiber. And that's the Vatican, Vatican City, up right above. So Hadrian chose a location across the Tiber where there were some imperial gardens for his tomb. Here you can better see, also Google Earth, a view of the Castle San Angelo as it looks today. The walls and the watchtowers were added later because this served as a fortress for the popes uh, when the po in the Vatican. The popes, uh, in bad times, they had an underground passageway that they could scurry uh, from the Vatican to this fortress where they could be protected. And that's when the uh, watchtowers and so on were added, as you can see here. Fronted by a bridge, this is the famous Ponte San Angelo, uh, designed by Bernini, the great 17th century architect Bernini, with a series of angels. And here, another view of the Castle San Angelo with Bernini's uh, angels on the bridge. The most important point for us is you can see that although uh, tombs, round tombs, were no longer au courant in the second century AD. They had gone out of fashion. Remember, Titus buried in his arch, Trajan buried in his column. They really weren't doing round tombs at the, at the, to the extent that they had been doing earlier. Hadrian chooses this. Why? Because the great mausoleum of Augustus was a round tomb. He wants to associate himself with Augustus, and he wants to create a new tomb for a succession of dynasties. Nerva was the last to be buried in the mausoleum of Augustus, Hadrian, the first in this mausoleum, which became, be, continued to be used in the second century. And so it uses the um, mausoleum of Augustus and the Cecilia Metella tomb as models. We see in this model here of the tomb of, of Hadrian, uh, it's round, made out of concrete, placed as the Cecilia Metella tomb was on a podium, a very tall podium probably a tumulus on top, earthen tumulus, like Augustus's tomb. We don't know what happened at the very apex, whether there was a statue of Hadrian 
or a temple-like structure as you see here. But the most important point for us is that at the end of his life, Hadrian is, is continuing to connect himself to Rome's first emperor, to Augustus, both of them in perpetuity, uh, Philhellenic emperors with Philhellenic leanings. But in, in the case of both of them, and particularly Hadrian, he combines it with this new concrete architecture in a very special, very distinctive way that will have a lasting impact on architecture in the Roman Empire.